You are listening to Gone But Never Forgotten. Our topics can include, but are not limited to, murder, sexual assault, graphic and gruesome details, and more. These topics are adult in nature and are not meant for everyone. Listener discretion is advised. So many of our episodes cover the loss of people, or the loss of life, and either offer up a sad ending or a story that has yet to be finished. This week, we're going traveling south of the border to the United States, and we are going to cover a case that starts out so similar to many of the cases that we have covered, and yet, one that has a happy ending. At the age of 14, a young girl was kidnapped right out of her home and from a room that she shared with her sister. The family fought hard never gave up hope, and never gave up on trying to find their beloved daughter. About nine months after she was abducted, all of the hard work and effort paid off, and the young girl was discovered about 29 kilometers from her home. Now, she is an advocate for missing persons and victims of sexual assault. Hello, and welcome to episode 56 of Gone But Never Forgotten, The Kidnapping and Return of Elizabeth Smart. And welcome back to GBNF. As Lance said off the top, this episode is a little bit different in that it is a solved case. However, we do like to share stories like this from time to time for two reasons. One, we like to give some level of hope to anyone out there who is still trying to find a loved one so that they know that there are indeed stories that have happy endings. Second, we like to remind everyone else that any little detail that you have or that you can give, regardless of whether you think that it's relevant or not, could be the tip that solves a case and even more importantly, saves a life. Before we get to that, we do want to remind you all that we are looking for stories of you or others seeing people being better in the world around us. If you have a story that you would like us to share at the end of one of our episodes, please email us or send us a message anywhere on social media. We will give you a shout out if we share your story, and your story can help give some hope to those around us in a time where many of us are struggling. And with that said, let's get to a story where the ending came because people were doing just that. Being better. Elizabeth Ann Smart was born on November 3rd of 1987 in Salt Lake City, Utah, to her father, Ed Smart, and her mother, Lois Smart. Ed was a very successful real estate developer, and Lois was a stay-at-home mom. Elizabeth was part of a large family, and she had four brothers and one sister, making for a large family of eight people. Elizabeth was the second oldest child in her family. The Smart family were devout members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, which is also known as the LDS Church or the Mormon Church. The LDS Church is a non-Trinitarian Christian church, which means that they do not believe in the traditional teachings of the Holy Trinity, which is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The LDS Church considers itself to be a restoration of the original church that was founded by Jesus Christ. Elizabeth Smart attended Bryan Middle School in Salt Lake City, Utah, and she was known as a smart, shy, obedient, and kind little girl. Her greatest passion in life as a child was playing the harp. She started playing at the age of five, and she practiced every day, often for hours on end. 
By the time that Elizabeth started middle school, she was being sought out by people in the community to play her harp at weddings and funerals because she excelled so much at the instrument. Elizabeth was also very skilled at horseback riding, and she was a distance runner who was training to compete with the cross-country team when she moved on to high school. Everything seemed to be going well for the young teenager in her life, at school, and she literally seemed to excel at everything that she ever attempted. Her young life, though, would be drastically disrupted when she was 14 years of age. On June 4, 2002, Elizabeth and her family attended a ceremony at her school where they were giving out the year-end awards. Elizabeth would win many different awards, both for her grades in academics and for her success in physical fitness. Everything really and truly did seem to be going very well for the young girl. However, on June 5th, 2002, just mere days before she was set to graduate from middle school, Elizabeth was home and in bed in the room that she shared with her sister, Mary Catherine, when around 1 a.m. she was awakened by the sound of footsteps in their room and the touch of cold metal against her cheek. A man would whisper to her in the dark, quote, I have a knife to your neck. Don't make a sound. Get out of bed and come with me or I will kill you and your family, unquote. Elizabeth did not want to put her family in harm's way, and she was led out of the room by that man. While all of that was going on, Elizabeth's younger sister, Mary Catherine, was pretending to be asleep. As soon as the kidnapper and Elizabeth left the room, Mary Catherine got out of bed with the intention of running to her parents' room. But when she got to the door, she saw both of them still in the hallway, and she was almost spotted by the kidnapper. At that point, Mary Catherine crept back to bed and waited until she knew that the coast was clear. It was just after 4 a.m. when Mary Catherine went into her parents' room and woke them up to let them know that someone had broken into the house and that she believed that Elizabeth had been taken. At first, Ed and Lois believed that Mary Catherine had been dreaming until they noticed that Elizabeth was not in the room and they also found a window screen that had been cut open with a knife. Mary Catherine would tell police that she believed that the man that took Elizabeth was a white man who was about as tall as her brother, who was 5'8", and she believed that he was between 30 and 40 years of age. She said that the man was wearing light-colored clothes and a golf hat. She also said that he had dark hair and dark hair on his arms and on the back of his hands. She said that the man had threatened Elizabeth with either a gun or a knife. Mary Catherine said that Elizabeth hit her leg or toe off of something as she was leaving the room. And she said, ouch, and the man told her that she better be quiet or he was going to hurt her. She also said that she heard Elizabeth ask the man why he was doing this. And she wasn't certain that she had heard the answer correctly, but she believed that the man said he was doing it for ransom. She said that the man was soft-spoken, polite, and calm, and even neatly dressed. One thing that was of note that Mary Catherine said was that she said that even though the man was whispering and talking very softly, she felt that the voice was familiar to her. She said that she believed that she had heard that voice before. Mary Catherine, however, did not get a good look at the kidnapper's face. The police did not announce that to the media, though, as they hoped that that information that they had was enough to hopefully spook whoever the man was. We've talked about this a few times in the past, but certainly the sooner that the information gets out, police know that certain things that are said or not said can make a difference. Some things can make a culprit panic or go on the run, and certain things can make a culprit perhaps turn themselves in. This is one of those decisions that I am glad that I personally am not put in charge of, because it can literally be a decision that decides life or death in a kidnapping. If the kidnapper thinks that the police may know who they are, that can make them make rash decisions. It is certainly a feel thing for every single investigation. On June 6, 2002, 
Ed and Lois went on television and they were pleading for the kidnapper to return Elizabeth to them and a huge search effort was undertaken by the Laura Recovery Center, which is a nonprofit organization that works to prevent kidnappings and abductions and to help recover victims. The organization is named after Linda Kate Smither, who was a 12-year-old girl that was kidnapped and murdered in 1997. The search took place using 2,000 volunteers, dogs, and even airplanes. Flyers were made up that could be accessed, printed, and circulated by anyone that wanted to help out. Unfortunately, the community search would wind down after no signs of the kidnapper or of Elizabeth were found and things started to spread out and other ways to try and locate them were being used. Unfortunately, the information that came from Mary Catherine did not help with the investigation. Because the details were so vague, and even though investigators spent a lot of time searching the bedroom and the home, there were no fingerprints and no DNA evidence found at the scene. Bloodhounds were taken through the home and then used to attempt to track, but that was also to no avail. There were a lot of potential suspects in this case, as police operated with knowledge that they had of people known to them and of people that were in the area. In all, hundreds of potential suspects were interviewed during the investigation into this case. One of the side effects of the case was that several criminals that were at large in the community were actually apprehended and returned to prison as well. However, with all of that work being done, Elizabeth was still not found. One of the people that was considered to be a person of interest in this case very early on was a man named Richard Ritchie. Richard was a man who worked as a handyman and he had a long history of drug abuse. One of the main reasons that he was looked at as a key suspect was that he had previously done work for the Smart family. Investigators believe that he could very well have been the man that took Elizabeth because his voice was one that had been familiar to Mary Catherine. This will be of note a little bit later on, but we'll get to that. As always is the case, even though searches and such were winding down, the family did not give up hope. They believed that Elizabeth was out there still, and they believed that there was still a chance that she could be returned home safely to her family. They made a website that gave all of the details that they could about the abduction, and they also posted home videos on the internet anywhere that they could, so that the public would see what Elizabeth looked like. Meanwhile, while all of the search efforts were going on, Elizabeth was going through hell. The man that had taken her from the family home took her through the foothills and forested areas behind her home until they reached a campsite in the middle of nowhere. Elizabeth realized once they were away from the home that she in fact knew her abductor. The man that had taken her from her family home was known to her as Emmanuel. The man claimed to be a religious preacher and claimed that he was on par with God himself. That camp was just outside of Salt Lake City, and this is where she would meet a second person, this one, a woman. When she arrived at the camp, the woman started to clean Elizabeth's feet, and she was taken out of her pajamas and dressed in a robe. When Elizabeth refused to change into the robe, the woman told her that if she didn't undress and dress herself, she would allow the man to rip her pajamas off and do it himself. Elizabeth was then part of a ceremony that she was told was to signify that she was now married to the man. After that, Elizabeth was raped. Something that would happen almost daily to Elizabeth after this. The man told Elizabeth that he was a Davidic king and that he would be stoned by a mob in seven years time and then he would rise from the dead to kill the Antichrist. He told Elizabeth that she was going to be the first of his many virgin brides that he planned to kidnap and bring to the encampment. Each of those wives, he said, would help in his battle against the Antichrist. Clearly, there's a lot going on here. I mean, this guy is literally telling her that he's going to kidnap these brides of his, and then he's going to fight the Antichrist. I mean, that doesn't really sound like the hero in the story here. But we'll get into that more as we discuss who these two people were and more about them. 
Elizabeth was chained to a tree with a metal cable, and it ensured that beyond her tent that she was kept in, she had very little room and ability to move. She was renamed Esther, and along with being repeatedly raped, the man threatened often also to kill her. She was also dosed with alcohol and drugs, and they would also intermittently starve Elizabeth and feed her garbage. All of this abuse that was committed against Elizabeth was committed by both the man and the woman who were keeping her hostage. Shockingly, on July 24th of 2002, police would be called to the home of Lois's sister after her daughter was stirred out of sleep by the sounds of someone trying to cut through her bedroom window. It would later be revealed that this was indeed the same two people attempting to this time kidnap Elizabeth's 15-year-old cousin in order to make her another bride. This is just so disgusting and brazen. So brazen. These two believed that they were invincible, clearly. To make an attempt on a second member of the same family like this? I can't even imagine the mindset of these two. This is clearly narcissism. Yep, you've got that right. However, their narcissism did not end there. In fact, the two kidnappers would take Elizabeth out in public many different times. They took some steps to ensure that she was not recognizable, including covering her face with a scarf or a veil, amongst other things. In August of 2002, one of those trips brought them, the three of them to the Salt Lake City Public Library where they actually were noticed because they stood out, because they were dressed so strangely. One of the patrons at the library noticed Elizabeth's eyes and, concerned, called the police. The police actually showed up at the library and had a discussion with Emmanuel. Emmanuel told the officer that the woman was his wife and the girl was his daughter, but was because of religious reasons they were not allowed to show their faces. When the officer tried to speak with the two women, neither spoke. Emmanuel said that their religion also forbade women from speaking in public. Would you believe that the officer left the library and accepted Emmanuel's reasoning? Honestly, like, how is that even possible? Elizabeth would later say that as the officer left, she felt like all hope for her walked out the door with him. She couldn't believe that the officer didn't press on, and she was also angry at herself for not trying to speak up and taking the chance to save herself. In September of 2002, the trio would actually get on a bus and go to San Diego, California, where they would live for a few months. They lived on various campsites and within various homeless shelters during that time. Elizabeth would also later say that the two kidnappers would also try and fail to abduct another girl during that time. And then, on October 12, 2002, Mary Catherine had a breakthrough that would be very pertinent to the case. While she was going through a Guinness Book of World Records, she came across a page that had a picture of a very muscular woman. She said that that picture suddenly made her remember a time when the family had found a homeless handyman and offered him money if he would work on the family's roof a year or so before. She remembered the man's voice was the same voice that she remembered from the night that Elizabeth was taken. The man in question was one in the same, the aforementioned Emmanuel. Elizabeth and her mom had met him in the fall of 2001 as he was panhandling in downtown Salt Lake City. Lois gave the man $5 and told him that he could earn more money if he worked on the roof of their home. He accepted the day job in November and did come work on the roof. When the family went to the police and said that they believed that they knew who had taken Elizabeth and told them about Emmanuel, the police did not believe that he was the right man. They believed that because of the short time that he was around the family and because of the long amount of time that had passed between then and the abduction, odds were that Emmanuel was not the man that they were looking for. That is infuriating. I think that one of the things that really gets to me when we cover cases on the show is that we hear how many leads that the police follow up on, but stuff like this right here makes me wonder how many leads that they don't follow up on. You're starting to sound a little bit like someone I know, like me. Be careful. It's a slippery slope. But you're not wrong. 
thankfully the family did exactly what we always tell people to do and they soldiered on and they got their own sketch artist to render a drawing of what Emmanuel looked like based on their description. Finally, in February of 2003, that sketch was released by the family to the media. It was shown on America's Most Wanted, it was shown on the news, and it was shown on Larry King Live. Relatives of Emmanuel recognized him from the photograph and gave up-to-date photographs of him to the police. Emmanuel was Brian David Mitchell. Around this time, David started talking about moving the three of them to a place that was far away from Salt Lake City. He mentioned places like New York or Boston. However, Elizabeth stepped up to the plate and did something that was incredibly intelligent. She played into the delusions that David had about himself and God and the Antichrist. Elizabeth told David that she believed that God wanted them to move back to Salt Lake City. David agreed with her, and soon after, the trio started to hitchhike back to Utah. And that is where the mistake was made that would lead to a happy ending in this story. On March 12, 2003, thanks to pictures, the pictures of David that were provided by his family, he was recognized walking with a woman and a girl in Sandy, Utah. They were spotted, actually, by two different couples that had seen the pictures of David all over the news. Thankfully, both couples called and reported that they saw David to the Sandy Police Department. Officers were immediately dispatched to the area, and the officers immediately recognized Elizabeth Smart, even though she was disguised. Brian David Mitchell and his accomplice, Wanda Barzi, were arrested that day on the spot. Brian David Mitchell was born on October 18, 1953, in Salt Lake City, Utah. He was the third of six children in a Mormon family. He came from a family where his mom was a teacher and his father was a social worker. So far, that doesn't sound awful. No, but like we usually discover as we delve a little into people that wind up afoul of the law, there were certainly some issues in the parenting styles to begin with. David's father taught him about sex by showing him explicit pictures in a medical journal and to teach young David about how to survive on his own, he would drive him to unfamiliar and desolate areas of Salt Lake City and make his son find his own way home. At the age of 16, David would then expose himself to a minor, and that was the beginning of his criminal record. He was sent to a juvenile hall. Then, at 19, he got married and had two children with a woman named Karen Minor, who was only 16 years old when they got married. When the two got a divorce, David took the children and fled the children to New Hampshire after the custody was awarded to Karen instead of him. For his entire adult life, David also admits that he has been addicted to drugs and alcohol. After two years living in New Hampshire, he returned to Salt Lake City. While there, he would be inspired by his brother to try and get clean from everything that he was addicted to, and he also got married for the second time, this time to a woman named Debbie who he would have two more children with. Debbie also had three children from a previous marriage. Debbie would allege that David was an abusive spouse and that he was abusive to her and the children, and she would then file for and they would get a divorce in 1984. After the separation, Debbie would allege that David sexually abused their three-year-old son. That was not ever proven, but David did have visits with his children supervised after those allegations. Another one of Debbie's daughters would also allege that David had sexually assaulted her for years while they were together. And I mean, odds are that there is something to that. What's the age-old saying? If it looks like a duck, and it swims like a duck, and it quacks like a duck, it's probably a duck. This man would go on to sexually assault and abuse and do awful things to Elizabeth Smart. So I would say that it's pretty likely that that's not where his deviant behavior began. I can't disagree with that. And as for Wanda, on the day that David and Debbie had their divorce finalized, she would marry David. 
Wanda Elaine Barzi was born on November 6th, 1945, also in Salt Lake City. And at the time that she got married to David, she was 40 years old and divorced with six children from her previous marriage. Wanda also had a sadistic history and was estranged from her children. One of her daughters in particular was very vocal about the emotional and physical abuse that Wanda had doled out on her. She even said that as a child, as a punishment, Wanda had forced her to eat her pet rabbit for dinner. David and Wanda would get very involved with the LDS church, and as mentioned, David would eventually start going by the name of Emmanuel, and he started to claim that he was a prophet from God, and he would tell others about his prophetic visions. For obvious reasons, that got both of them kicked out of the church, and the church distanced themselves from David and Wanda quickly for their blasphemy. Wanda would also start to go by a different name, Hephzibah, another biblical name from the Old Testament. The two would take to the streets of Salt Lake City and become panhandlers. David took on the image of Jesus, wearing robes and growing his beard out. These two were crazy, a long line of crazy, if you ask me. As you can expect if you are following along at home, the court system realized that as well, and they were requesting that David undergo evaluations to see if he was even competent enough to go to trial. While the testing was held, David would be held at the Utah State Hospital. The defense team used a psychologist named Stephen Golding, who would present to court that David was delusional, and thus it was his opinion that David was not mentally capable to stand trial or be tried at all for his crimes. That old defense... Thankfully, and yes, we've said that a lot about this case, the court ruled against Golding and determined in 2004 that David was indeed mentally competent enough to go to trial. And for anyone that knows much about court proceedings, you know that the next step is to search for a plea deal. The defense team said that David was willing to plead guilty to kidnapping and burglary, which would likely carry a 10 to 15 year sentence for him. The condition, though, was that they did not want Elizabeth to be able to testify at all against David. The prosecution wasn't going to have any of that, however, and they did not make a plea deal. They were not willing to drop the charges against David for sexual assault, and they were not going to forbid Elizabeth from testifying against the man that had taken her and abused her. And thus, the delays began. So much delay. A psychologist who had previously testified that David was mentally competent to stand trial was told to sit down with David again, and this time, after the interview, for the first time, David's defense team fell back on the defense that he was not competent to stand trial. This was already February of 2005, almost two years after David was arrested. What is interesting of note here is that jail staff did not note any difference in David from the very beginning up until that time. However, the judge in charge of the case, Judy Atherton, agreed with the defense and said that David's behavior was a sign of psychosis, and as such, he went back from jail to Utah State Hospital in August of 2005, and he stayed there until 2008. While at the state hospital, though, it is also of note that the hospital staff did not know anything about David that showed that he was paranoid or suffering from psychosis. In October of 2008, now over five years later, the case was transferred from Utah courts to federal court and more hearings were held discussing David's competency. Those hearings were held from November 30th until December 11th of 2009, now over six years later. As a part of those hearings, Elizabeth would describe David as, quote, smart, articulate, evil, wicked, manipulative, sneaky, slimy, selfish, greedy, not spiritual, not religious, and not close to God, unquote. Finally, a 206-page report was done on David and his competency. Evaluations were done by many psychiatrists, and interviews were done with many people that knew him, including Wanda, his family, and Elizabeth. 
He was diagnosed with non-exclusive pedophilia, antisocial personality disorder, narcissistic personality disorder, malingering, and alcohol abuse. Mitchell was finally, again, cleared to stand trial on March 1st, 2010. Wanda would plead guilty and be given 15 years in state and federal prison. David would finally go to trial on November 8th, 2010. His defense team would even say that he was guilty of all of the things that he was charged with, but would say that he was legally insane when he committed them, and moved that he should be found not guilty on the grounds of insanity. That was rejected on December 11, 2010, though, as a jury found him guilty of kidnapping and transporting a minor across state lines with the intent to engage in sexual activity. David Mitchell was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole over eight years after Elizabeth was taken from her home. Today, David Mitchell is serving his sentence at Terre Haute, a high-security prison in Indiana. Wanda Barzi was released in September of 2018. Elizabeth Smart is now Elizabeth Gilmore by marriage, and she is an American child safety activist, and she is also a commentator on ABC News. She is an advocate for missing persons. You can learn more about what Elizabeth is doing by going to elizabethsmartfoundation.org. The Elizabeth Smart Foundation is bringing hope and ending the victimization and exploitation of sexual assault through education, healing, and advocacy. And that is what we have for you this week. A story of perseverance from the family, a story of perseverance from the victim, a story of never giving up and getting a happy ending in spite of bad people, some sketchy police work, and some bad decisions. So... If you're out there and you're struggling with anything, not just something of this magnitude, remember that you can persevere and you too can find the happy ending that you want and that you deserve. Come join us over on Patreon when you're finished with this episode at www.patreon.com slash gbnfpodcast and we will talk some more about our thoughts and emotions and go a little more in depth with what we think like we do each and every week. And don't forget to come back next week for episode 57. 57 of Gone But Never Forgotten. 